Recently, I set forth the idea of the moderation fallacy. To recapitulate my general point, the moderation fallacy is the notion that being in the perceived middle of the political spectrum increases the respectability, validity, and accuracy of any given political opinion. In my earlier video, I focused on the idea itself and tried to give it a bit of an intellectual genealogy. In this video, I will show how I discovered the moderation fallacy by looking at a few of the countless examples of this fallacy at work in both the discourse and practice of American politics at all levels. There are a variety of ways to fall afoul of the moderation fallacy. While I prefer punching up and hammering the elite for its intellectual shortcomings, I am actually going to begin by looking at how amateur political scientists at the undergraduate level can make themselves appear foolish. I spent the first two years of my high school experience in Kansas and then moved, finishing up in Virginia. Fast forward to the 2008 election when I was an undergraduate and I had added most of my old Kansas friends to Facebook. Two of my old friends, who were twins, had both become political science majors and both of them planned on going to grad school at K-State for that very subject. Interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, both of them held identical political positions. Judging the American political spectrum by their experiences in Kansas, the twins developed the notion that they were moderates by virtue of the fact that while they were against abortion, they were not in favor of executing doctors who performed abortion. They were also in favor of Bush's economic policies, foreign wars, and policy against gay marriage, all of which were apparently to center positions among K-State political science undergraduates. Based on their preferred policy preferences, they informed me that McCain was the best choice for president and that Obama was a left-wing extremist. Further, I was a left-wing extremist and I had no idea what I was talking about when I said that Obama was going to win the election because I was so out of touch with mainstream political thought. At the time, I was already firmly on the left, but my 2008 self was hardly an extremist and I did foolishly think that Obama was a real liberal. At any rate, when Obama won, one of the twins had a Facebook update to the effect that his election would destroy the federal government. I remember gently mocking his fears on election night and then being dropped and blocked by both twins the next day. The lesson here is that if you are, a de if you are dedicated to riding the fence, make sure that you know where the fence is before you subject your testicles to straddling an unbending piece of metal. Many bullshitters, from would-be peacemakers and a group of fractious friends, to graduate students who didn't quite make it through all the assigned readings for a seminar, have benefited from the moderation fallacy over the years. The way that these bullshit artists benefit from the moderation fallacy is by using an appeal to a middle position as a way to disguise his or her own ignorance of the subject at hand. Now, I will grant that there are plenty of times in both personal and academic affairs when a middle position holds a great deal of merit. Maybe both Sally and Sue have unreasonable expectations, and maybe Athens was the product of both rational and irrational modes of thought, for instance. However, the genius of the bullshit artist is that they have the ability to lull his or her listener into a compromised coma where the appeal to a middle ground will stave off any questions which might reveal that the proposer is in fact a bullshitter. The potential danger of the bullshit artist can be evaded by vigilance and by not allowing a self-identified moderate to get away with providing less evidence of his or her position than someone with a stronger opinion. The mentioning of everyday bullshit artists is a great segue for talking about professional bullshit artists normally called politicians in standard English parlance. The politician who best took advantage of the moderation fallacy was former Louisiana Democratic Senator from 1987 to 2005 and current lobbyist John Bro, spelled B-R-E-A-U-X. The aptly named Bro's default position was finding a position in the dead center of whatever the Democrats and Republicans wanted, Bro. By painting himself as a convinced moderate and an acolyte, an acolyte of capital C compromise, Bro was able to sell himself off as a pragmatic dealmaker who helped to keep the government running smoothly. If we actually take a look at the positions that he took, however, his record is much more negative than positive. First, let's take a look at the positive. In 1995, Bro voted against a trio of deregulatory measures, most notably the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, the gist of which was to make it harder to punish malefactors who break the rules that keep the stock market somewhat stable. In the summer of 2004, shortly before he left office, Bro was the lone vote against a measure authorizing the FCC to increase its maximum fine from $27,500 to $275,000 for broadcasting obscene, indecent, or profane language. 
These two instances stand alone in a sea of bro voting for things which turned out to be harmful for the American people. Let's run through some of bro's less charming votes. He was one of seven Southern Democrats who voted to put Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. He tended to vote against environmental protections. He voted in favor of NAFTA. He voted in favor of welfare reform. He voted in favor of the balanced budget amendment. He voted to abolish the estate tax. He voted in favor of tighter bankruptcy laws as they apply to common citizens. And he voted in favor of the Bush tax cuts. His 50-50 moderate bro moment came during the debate over the Bush tax cuts where he took up a position between Bush's $700 billion in, in cuts and the Democrats' $0 position by proposing tax cuts of $350 billion. What these $350 billion tax cuts were designed to achieve or how they would address the concerns of either side in any meaningful way is a mystery to everyone except for John Bro. Bro now works as a lobbyist for Squire Patton Boggs, a firm which represents an assortment of wealthy celebrities and foreign governments and includes such luminaries as Trent Lott and John Boehner. One of this firm's best-known causes is when it defended the Guatemalan government's death squads in the mid-1990s. The lesson that we should take away from John Bro's career is that it is far too easy for politicians to take up the mantle of moderation by being a member of one party and voting for the other. Rather than praise such people for their virtue, it behooves us to actually examine what they stand for and see how a politician's alleged moderate views impact the public interest. John Bro has had many political successors who have taken up labels like Southern Democrat and Third Way Democrat. His successors include such self-proclaimed moderates as Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Claire McCaskill of Missouri, and even the less openly moderate Dianne Feinstein of California. Joe Manchin claims that his positions represent the, quote, radical center, which is a fun oxymoron to contemplate. In reality, Manchin uses conservative rhetoric and votes like a conservative on most issues, social and economic. Manchin's only claim to being a Democrat are the D next to his name and his consistent defense of the ACA. Despite voting for most of Trump's cabinet nominees and being one of the few Democrats who supported Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords, Trump claimed in a December 29, 2017 interview that Manchin is not really a centrist and that it is all just a bunch of bullshit that he makes when he says that, and the implication being, of course, that he's actually a liberal. Claire McCaskill paints herself as a moderate Democrat, and some of her rhetoric is not dissimilar to Manchin's. One of the major points of difference is that McCaskill has actually voted for several liberal causes, including tighter regulations on guns. When asked about whether or not she would support a single-payer health care system in March 2017, McCaskill came out as adamantly opposed to something that is now supported by a majority of Americans across party lines. During the 2016 primary, McCaskill was also an outspoken advocate for Hillary Clinton and took lots of shots at Bernie Sanders for being too far left without ever actually acknowledging that his positions are more popular with the American public and therefore, in a sense, dare I say it, more moderate than her own. Dianne Feinstein is socially liberal and will generally vote with the Democrats on major televised partisan disputes. However, she's in favor of a hawkish, aggressive foreign policy and gladly takes up the cause of large companies like Google against the American people when it comes to the issue of privacy. As for her stance on health care, Feinstein, who represents arguably the most liberal state in America, repeated a GOP talking point about a government takeover of health care and how she was not ready to countenance such a thing. Feinstein, while she portrays herself as a vaguely liberal person, is actually every bit as complicit in upholding the interest of corporate America as her more openly moderate colleagues. The idea that a corporate Democrat will live up to the principles of the Democratic Party and advance freedom and prosperity for the common person is a farce. Corporate or moderate Democrats are just at calmer, less brazenly offensive Republicans whose stances on key issues still leave the American people more impoverished and less free. Of course, it is also noteworthy that there is no point in a Democrat trying to appease Republicans and win their respect when Republicans will still label the corporate Democratic moderates as left-wing ideologues. Even the magnificent reward of filling smugly in Scots in the Goldilocks zone of the Overton window isn't worth being scorned by the ones you're bending over backwards to please. 
The Republican Party has moved beyond the pretense of using the word moderate since about 2010 or so, except on rare occasions when it is self-serving. Anakin Skywalker has accepted that he is Darth Vader, that he is evil, and that evil is fun. Most Republicans proudly proclaim themselves to be conservatives who begin each day by reflecting on what the flag means to them and how they can live their lives in the way that Jesus and Ronald Reagan intended. That being said, occasionally a Republican senator or two will try to claim the middle of the American spectrum and label their opponents as too extreme. The chief examples that spring to mind are Senators John McCain of Arizona, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, and Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee. McCain is the best known of this trio since he ran for president in 2008 as a GOP nominee. In that campaign, he was running in the wake of George W. Bush's disastrous two terms in office, so he was playing up his reputation as a maverick. In fact, his voting record showed that it was quite rare when he strayed from the party line, and since 2008, it has become even more uncommon. So far as I'm aware, every instance of McCain voting against or speaking out against his own party has been the result of him taking a personal feud that he has with a particular individual and then turning that into a public thing. For instance, he criticized George W. Bush frequently on The Daily Show and The Colbert Report in the wake of getting robbed during the 2000 presidential primaries where Bush's team spread slander about McCain fathering a bastard child. McCain's criticisms of Trump only ramped up once Trump criticized him for being a POW. When you look at McCain's voting record, however, it is clear that he supported every major initiative of both of these right-wing presidents. Further, if you look at McCain's 2008 platform, he ran on a platform which was more or less a continuation of Bush's policies, just with a new guy in charge. McCain's heroic moderate views are being praised to the heavens now because much of the mainstream media has an obsession with anyone who bashes Trump, and McCain can be lauded and celebrated because he has terminal brain cancer. The truth is, when he dies, the American people won't lose anything, much less a moderate. As for Senator Lindsey Graham, he is a great example of how the Republican shift away from the word moderate has created an even goofier semantic showdown over the true nature of Reagan's legacy. The Tea Party attacked Graham as a moderate, and he responded by saying that he is a Reagan Republican. If you've ever watched any of the last three Republican presidential primaries, then you know that every Republican hopeful is the one true heir of Ronald Reagan. Graham may not be as extreme as some of his colleagues, but he is still very right-wing, and he has never encountered a war that he doesn't want to fight. During the 2016 primaries, Graham advocated staying in Iraq and Afghanistan forever with no exit strategy. Graham's claims to being a moderate rest solely on the insanity of the rest of the people in his party and his waffling on climate change during the first two years of Obama's administration before he came down on the wrong side of that issue. As for Bob Corker, he has become a media darling because he has figured out that Donald Trump is bad. That's kind of like figuring out that smoking cigarettes is bad for your health, which everyone except for Mike Pence seems to understand. Corker's claims to being a moderate are that he thinks that Trump is inappropriate and that he once was against having the government intervene in outlawing abortion, although he is not now. On the initial vote for the Trump tax cuts, Corker was the lone Republican dissenter. On the second vote, he voted in favor of the measure. The second vote was more in favor of Corker's previous votes since this was the first time in his life that he saw a tax giveaway to the rich that he didn't like. What changed between the two versions of the bill, you might ask? The second version included the provision nicknamed the Corker Kickback that would enrich the retiring Corker on a personal level. So if we think Corker is a moderate, then we are essentially saying that being a moderate is someone whose vote is up for sale. If we compare that definition to the reasonable, principled moderate of lore, I think we may have gotten considerably closer to the truth. In conclusion, I want to clarify that being a moderate in any system is neither good nor bad. It merely means that you are in between two common political positions. If we look at American politics before the Supreme Court allowed money to take over and corrupt the system in the late 1970s, then moderates actually did play a key role in our political ecology. In our current system, where we have two corrupt parties which exist to serve the interests of corporations, taking up a moderate position is a failure to recognize what the issues are while being a moderate politician is simply holding out for the sweetest and most lucrative lobbying gig once you leave office. For the time being, moderation will provide no solutions for the pressing problems of our struggling state.